Well, it's April 20th, 2022. Welcome to News BT on Metro TV with me, Annie Ofompo. It's time for us to give you updates of what's trending in across the country and outside uh, of this country, Ghana, as well. Now, let's take a look at headlines of stories coming up. Police in Upper West Region arrest two persons for alleged involvement in a de deadly attack on a Sisala West constituency in Asara coordinator of the MPP, Idrisu Walaika. As more political analysts dissect, dissect the Economist Intelligence Unit's comments on John Dramani Mahama, yet another polls emerge showing MPP's Alan Chermatin catching up with Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, James Kuche Aveji, uh, to recommend a fine of not less than 2,500 penalty units against institutions that breach public procurement laws as the committee takes its setting to the Northern Regional Capital. The news now in detail. Now, police in the Upper West region have arrested two persons for their alleged involvement in a deadly attack on the Sisala West constituency, Nasara coordinator of the New Patriotic Party MPP, Idrisu Walaika. The incident happened on Monday, April 18, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. at Golu, the capital of Sisala West district. The Sisala West constituency Nasara coordinator of the new patriotic party in the Upper West region, Musa Walaika Idrisu, is currently battling for his life after he was inflicted with machete wounds on Monday. He is currently on admission at the Upper West Regional Hospital. Meanwhile, the police in the area have arrested two persons in connection with the attack. The two are reported to be among a group of young men who attacked the Nasara coordinator and inflicted deep machete wounds on him. They accused him of burying a talisman to turn the outcome of the upcoming NPP constituency executive elections around to the benefit of his favorite candidate. The victim was bitten to the pulp and dragged to the palace of the paramount chief of Golu. Now let's do some more stories and uh, four more suspects in connection with the illegal demolition exercise at the Pampaso Number no. 2, a suburb of Nswam Adurajuri, municipality of the Eastern Region, have been arrested together with earlier suspects. Now speaking to the Eastern Regional Police PRO ACP Ebenezer Tete, he, the suspects were smoked out at Ticha Mante, another adjoining community. The suspects are Kwame Agbovi, a Mason, uh, a 49-year-old musician, Kwe Kubwedu, a 35-year-old Mason, Tay Dixon, a 33-year-old Okada Ryder, a Fiedenyu, and a 35-year-old welder, Benjamin Enum. The police says all in all, they have seven suspects in their custody. Now, the prime suspect is, however, still on the run. ASP Tete noted that the suspects are being investigated and will be charged accordingly and arranged to face the full rigors of the law. Now, Chief Inspector of the Pimpiasim in Accra, Ni Togbo Obodai Ampao, has called on President Akufuado to investigate the demolition of structures at the Mempiasem. Uh, he says this subjects have been illegally ejected from their lands without recourse to court or a legitimate court order. Barely a year after some property owners at East Legon Mempasem cried foul for being victims of an illegal demolition exercise, they say some individuals and state officials remain bent on ejecting them from their legally acquired lands. 
at a press conference held in Accra, the chief of Mimpasem, Tobo Obodai Ampao. The Sith, who is not happy with happening so far, said his residents are currently the subjects of unlawful and targeted destruction of properties by some individuals under the guise of undertaking land reclamation exercise on behalf of the state. The accused Juan Clement Jato for their woes. <laughs> We want the president to call those doing the demolition to order. The land belongs to us, and therefore we will never agree to yet another demolition. She won't get president again. We are appealing to him. Calling the president there. Some affected residents spoke bitterly of the demolition and called on government to intervene. Chiefs in the year 2009, and I've been living on this property all these years until last year. For no reason, some land guards came with some machines and then started vandalizing a property that the land we are, we are occupying belongs to the government. For the, the community, we came together, we wrote petitions to the chief of staff, to the president, to the lands ministry. We've engaged with them that this land was released by the Kufo administration to the chiefs, and we legally came to buy it accordingly. The land is never a government property. It is our land, and we will not allow any unlawful demolition. Government land, no way. Clement Jato, me mama shoye, uba fi mi ana e plus, me slamo, me no bravo bia. Meanwhile, the man at the center of the issue, who is also in charge of government lands acquired through legislative instruments, Clement Jato, in reacting to the claims, said they were acting through the law. I mean, they were trying to pin a plus against Jato. That's all. That was the intention, and it it, it didn't work. So I don't see a plaza. I don't know whether a plaza has got any structure here, though. If he has, it will be taken from him. An incumbent structure, it will be a land. It will be taken from a plaza. The Encroachers Residents Association's press conference. I think it's it's wrong. Instead of them going to the appropriate quarters to register their displeasure about probably my exercise. They are calling names, insulting government, which is wrong. At least, if every one of us should go taking government land, I mean, there won't there be chaos in this country? But you've taken. Government says, okay, keep it, but come and regularize. That one too, you don't want to do? I find it difficult to understand. A very devastating situation at Mimpiasem. Uh, there, let's do some other stories. A member of parliament for the Ningo Pam Pam constituency, Sam Nete George, has argued that confidence in the judiciary as a low level, uh, is a, it's low level due to decisions taken by the courts in recent times. Now, he cited the recent ruling of the courts in a Singh North MP uh, dual citizenship case. However, former member of parliament for the Lujukuku constituency and former deputy minister for for health, uh, Dr. Bernard Okoboy insists that the court's ruling is credible. They spoke on Good Morning Ghana. So today, President Akufuado is a beneficiary of the NDC's thinking and forced Republican democracy. And the NPP is a beneficiary of it. Oko has been a beneficiary of it. He's come to parliament. He's been a deputy minister, just like myself. Beneficiary. So, we need to protect it despite our misgivings. And the, the dictates of the democracy that we bear, when you have a problem, the venue for venting your, your spleen is the court. We could have chosen to say we won't do it, we would lead to public unrest and all of that. But then, given the temperature of this country and the hardship, and as a responsible democracy, we would rather err on the side of caution and go before the same judges and hope and pray that the good Lord who I serve will touch their hearts. Because the Bible tells us the hearts of kings is in his hands and he cleans them any way he so pleases. Just the Supreme Court doesn't want a situation where a court has given 
um, how do you call it, a decision, injected someone, the fellow is, is what, flagrantly abusing it. In any case, there's a reason why Jesse Quais, uh, Quaisin has never stepped near parliament after the Supreme Court judgment. Doc, you know why? Mm. The reason is very simple. Monkeys play by senses. That's what the court, this one I'm giving my interpretation, that's what they wanted to send out there. Quaisin was going to parliament when a high court judge told him, don't step there. But when the Supreme Court spoke, he stayed in his house at Asilo. Do you know what it means? Mm. And that's why um, um, our lawyers went to the Supreme Court. Mm. Monkeys play by their side. They know that when the Supreme Court speaks, all those people who carry themselves like they are untouchable, they will bring themselves to order. So, Doc, it is not illegal, let me state it on this platform, mm. for a Supreme Court to assume functions of all the lower courts. If you study law, they will teach you. They can assume especially when they want to protect the sanctity of our legal system and that of the so, so. Well, we'll stay a little longer. Well, the Good Morning Ghana team and former Legikuku legislature, Dr. Okoboy, says the E-Levy uh, would have gone into fixing the country's roads. Fix, um, speaking on Good Morning Ghana, he also said the caterers of the school feeding program could also have been paid using the resources from the E-Levy. However, a member of parliament for Ningo Pram Pram constituency, Sam George, uh, who was also on the program, said the government had not even put structures to collect the amounts that will be accrued from the e-levy. This e-levy thing, eh? mm. I've already put out the fact that they set up a technical committee at GRA to execute this. If you read the law, the law that they claim, the e-levy the e law that they claim they passed illegally in parliament, in that law, 6.62, 6 is saying that they cannot contract a private company for revenue assurance or, 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 or collection purposes. However, they are dealing with a private company called Express Pay to do the collection and build a monitoring platform for them, which they are going to buy. They want to buy for $40 million. Cool. GRA and persons at the Ministry of Finance. Huh? Yes. This is not the first time I'm putting it. I put this information out three weeks ago. They've not been able to respond to it. They can't come out and counter it. I said they are using a company called Express Pay. To do what? To build a monitoring platform for GRE. Now, Express Pay doesn't even have the capacity to build a monitoring platform. Express Pay is looking to go and use a cloud computing, a serverless cloud computing system in Northern Ireland by Amazon Web Services, AWS. They are now trying to see how well they can roll in Kelly GVG to also help them do some part of revenue assurance. As we speak, the telcos who are supposed to plug in and monitor and do these financial transactions and deductions have not even seen what the API and the architecture, security architecture. The NDC is in court. Look, yes. they've used the parliamentary numbers they have mm. to frustrate the passage of the levy. Mm. And you see, unfortunately, let me say this, they've put party ahead of country. The NDC knows that if this law is passed, I say it all the time that tax is not anything that anybody likes. So I normally don't like to talk or justify a tax. Mm. But the reality is that we are a country that has spent a lot of resources that we don't have on our own. And to stop that kind of life, we must try to increase what we generate. Mm. Maybe people can have ideas about other options. But for now, what we've settled on was the e-levy. Look, if we had succeeded in passing it in the first quarter, we would have gotten some money that I believe maybe would have paid some caterers or finished some road quick, or quick, fixed quick, some quick, problem. Quick, Look, quick, 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 quick. Now, the strategy they had, I believe, was to frustrate us so that it would make the revenue inflows not come. Well, let's see how E-Levy goes on 1st of May 2022. Now, let's turn our attention to more polls coming in uh, as far as elections 2024 is concerned. Now, the second national tracking poll by Global Info Analytics on the two major political parties say Trade Minister Alan Kojuchemating is staging a strong comeback in the race to lead the MPP in the 2024 elections. Now, uh, Dr. Baumia, who had a commanding lead in January 2022 polls, has dropped to second position. 
from uh, the camp or from the camp of the NDC, uh, John Mahama continues to increase his lead over his rivals. Now, former Minister of Finance, Dr. Kamna Dufo and Kojo Bonsu, former mayor of Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly, are also said to be in the race. So now let's take a look at, uh, you know, how the diagrams of, uh, uh, I think, uh, bar charts captures uh, these statistics or analysis that's been done. Okay, so we have a highlight of the national tracking poll and it says that do you approve, do you approve of this performance? Or, or do, you approve, do, do you approve or disapprove of the performance of the president? And uh, we have uh, the highest being 67%. Uh, of disapproving, 67% of disapproval. The next one, disapproval, is 58% uh, uh, by the key of the diagram. You see that in January, uh, January is represented by the light blue, and April 2022 is represented by the uh, military blue. I don't know how you call it. <laughs> but so in, in January, uh, the percentage was uh, 58 and it increased by April 22 to 67%. Um, you would see that those who approve of it is just 34%. That was in January. And by uh, April, it dropped to 27%. That's those who approve of it. Now, those who have no opinion, they have the lowest uh, you know, percentages. And you would see that. Um, the, in January, we had 8% who had no opinion, and by April, we had 6% of persons who had no opinion. So um, this one also says highlights of, okay, do you approve or disapprove? It still continues. Um, if you can give me the previous slide, because it had some sentence I want to continue. Okay, so it says, while the NDC floating voters were empath uh, empath empathic about the direction of the country, wrong direction, 84% and 69%, NPP voters are still split in the middle of 47% to 47% for right and wrong directions. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And it says that, Okay, how do you rank the performance of the government? So the performance ranking, excellent, excellent. The key for this bar chart says the baseline is um, light blue and the Q1, that's a quarter one, 2022, is represented by uh, the military blue. That's a deep blue. So uh, the baseline, excellent per persons, we had 7% and then 5% for quarter one. And then the very good, we have 32% uh, for the baseline. And then by end of quarter one, we had people of 24% saying that it was, it's very good. And then we have the average baseline starting, it says 24%, and by end of quarter one, we had 23%, reduction of 1%. And then the very high ones, you see that is poor or very poor. Um, the baseline had 37% and end of quarter one, we had 48%. Right. So uh, I, I have uh, Mr. Is it Di Executive Director yes. okay, of the Global Info Analytics Limited, and that's in the person of uh, Mr. Musa Dankwa with me. You're welcome. Thank you, madam. Uh, good afternoon to you. Okay, so this is how will you respond to the approval of e-levy? Okay, that's interesting. Let's, let's capture that one. Uh, where's the key? So the e levy, how will you respond? No effective on how I use my momo. No effect on how I use my momo is 9%. Fine alternative to you to avoid tax is 18%. And then the very highest one that's in about gold color or carry color, it says use momo when it's withdraw, okay, when it's absolutely necessary. When it's absolutely necessary, it's 40%. That's the highest. So people who actually think that uh, uh, I don't want to be deducted, I'll use e-levy only, oh, sorry, the momo only when it's very necessary. And then 26% says withdraw my funds. That's high. 26% is quite high. I don't use momo. It's 7%. So I, I want to belong to that one <laughs> and not to. So uh, Mr. Musa uh, Dankwa, thank you for your time once again. My pleasure. Um,
that is a very comprehensive report, um, um, research that you conducted. Tell us about it. Um, as we promised the country, uh, we will be doing this every quarter. Uh, we did a baseline study uh, sometime in January. And April was the third month that we have to go back. So between 7th April and 18th April, we were in the field across 68 uh, constituencies in the country, in, in all the 16 regions. So the results started coming, coming back uh, yesterday. That's what we are seeing. Wow. In all 16 regions? Yes. So uh, what are the classes of persons you interact with? No, we, every voter, mm -hmm. anybody who is 16 years plus, because by 2024, those 16 will be voting. Mm -hmm. So if we meet you and you are between 16 and above, uh, we, we interview you. Yes. What advice your choice of questions? Um, normally, I suppose that you must first be guided by the uh, situation in the country was going on mm -hmm. and we know the economy is a big issue we know e-levy 2 has been passed and we know the corruption is an issue right. also know that there is issue about supreme court and their uh, kind of um, what should i say confidence in the supreme court so we mm -hmm. took some of these questions as a one of questions to go and test them in the field to see what people think about them how did they respond to the supreme court question yes i think um i, I don't know if you have that data but let's see we, we said we asked them whether they have high confidence in the judiciary as mm -hmm. a whole. And about 26% said they have high or very high confidence. About 47% said they have low or very low confidence of the wow. judiciary as a whole. 47%. Yes. And then we said to them that in the case of Supreme Court in particular, how confident are you that they will be able to dispense justice without fear or favor, especially when it comes to political cases? And the same number, almost 27%, yes, they have confidence. And 47% said they have no confidence in that. So it's a stark kind of uh, revelation that this poll has shown us. What reflection does it give, especially in the case of the Supreme Court? I think this comes at the back of what Ken Depa has been saying and what people have been saying. Uh, and people are watching the news. They know what is happening. And this is a bit of reflection of what people, the center of, of people in the country at the moment, with regard to the judiciary and the Supreme Court in particular. Wow. Let's uh, turn our attention to the MPP's primaries. Yes. Voters' choice. So we have Dr. Baumia Lancherman, uh, Dr. Kudri uh, Okuto, Boachi Ejaku, Dr. Kunido Apreku, Dr. Kennedy Ejepon, uh, Arnold Bujoka, Te Francis uh, Adainimo. Uh, okay. So I think we'll limit ourselves to the, the top, first, two. top two. The first top two, the front runners. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So January, we had uh, what, 37? 39.7% yes. for Dr. Baumia. Yeah. Uh, end of quarter one, 33.2. Uh, okay. And then change is six. And then uh, Alan Chair Martin, 28, rose to 35. Yes. And then six, seven, whatever, 0.36 difference. Okay. So uh, Alan Chair Martin is obviously coming up. What's informing his. Uh... Well, we. In January, His Excellency Baumia had a very commanding lead, as mm -hmm. you can see. And um, between that time and now, there has been a dramatic shift in the poll numbers. Um, we witnessed this across the entire country, in particular in the Akan areas. Dr. Baumia appears to have kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan won Ashanti region for the first time, which he lost in January. He's disappeared in the Akan area? Yes, in wow. terms of, in Eastern region in particular, it was so dramatic that he only got 8% of the vote in Eastern region. Did you uh, sort to... Uh, we don't ask them why. You didn't, we are didn't only asking out. you who would you vote for if you are a delegate at the MPP uh, uh, primaries. Whatever reasons you have, that's your personal reason. We don't ask you why are you voting A or Mr. B. Okay. But our findings show that Baumia has lost grounds in Eastern region very significantly. And Alan has made up the loss he suffered in Ashanti region. And he's also winning in Western region and across all the southern parts. Wow. You say you didn't seek to find out what... No, that's not what we went reasons. there to do. No. Okay. It would have been, would have been interesting to... No, okay, that's for somebody's job to go and do so, that. Yeah, yes. I guess so. Yes. I guess so. So, well, uh, this is for the NDC. Yes. Uh, John Mahama, Dr. Kwabna Dufour, Kojo Bonsu, and as well, we limited to the first two. So, John Mahama, obviously, January uh, was uh, clocking at 53 point, Okay, 53%. And Q quarter, end of Q quarter, second... Sorry, first quarter, uh, is up by 57% plus 4%. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Kobna Dufour, 15% by, that's the baseline. And then by end of Q1, 
dropped to 12% <laughs> minus. Why is that? Well, we don't know why, but what uh, people are telling us is that they want to vote for John Mahama to lead the NDC in 2024. So we've seen his numbers go up by plus 4%, and that of before coming down by uh, minus 3%. Now, the entrance into the race by Fudu uh, <coughs> Bonsu may have affected the uh, Dufo numbers because most Lashanti region tend to go for Dufo. But when we threw in Kudu Bonsu, some of the uh, voters that would have gone for Dufo went for Kudu Bonsu. How does this. Uh I don't know if it's contradicting that of the EIE report that came in that we will start Certainly it does, yesterday. because... Because the EIE says the NDC will win, but they have more chance if they change or they bring a fresh candidate, right? See, um, when it comes to polling, you must understand why are they saying that. Now, in all the data that we have seen, we have threw a number of NDC candidates ac across and none of them has performed. Okay. So there's no any brand in NDC right now that can oh. attract voters like Mahama is doing. Now, what we also have to do is that maybe subsequently we can look at that data. Which candidate is able to pull supporters from other parties to join him? Okay. At the moment, Mahama is doing that. Okay. If you look at the MPP numbers, people who are voting for either Alan or Baumia in the general election, that is more MPP people who are defecting to Mahama's camp. That makes nonsense of the EIU's Mahama clause. Absolutely. Clause. E EIU doesn't do polling. What did they do? It's a research, a desktop research. It's based on people's the interview sentiment on the people they, they talk to. We actually go to the ground and speak to the voters, people who will go and vote in the elections. So you should, you should rather trust in our numbers than anybody else's because if you don't talk to the polls, the people in the ground, it's meaningless. I, I guess we'll be getting some more of these researches coming up, but we're going to extend the discussion uh, later sure. on different platforms. Executive Director of Global Info Analytics, Musa Dankwa, thank you. For joining us yeah. here. So you're also watching Newsbeat here on Metro TV. It's interesting how some of these posts are, you know, coming in. Uh, we'll do some more analysis for now. Let's go for a break. All right, you're welcome back. Uh, now, the Greater Accra Regional Minister Henry Corte has asked traders on the streets of Accra to relocate to a designated points for selling or risk the rough of the assembly. He spoke at the official opening of the operation Clean Your Frontage Office in Accra. Let me also use the opportunity to appeal to traders doing business along the Odor River and Circle and its environs. I've heard that they have given us an ultimatum of two weeks that they will come to the streets. Respectfully, I want to send them a warning or a notice they won't even last for one week. A place has been found for them. The MCE is busily working on the place, and we entreat all of them to go to that area and do business. The move comes two months after the piloting of Operation Clean Your Frontage on February 1, 2022. Speaking at the official opening, the Regional Minister Henry Quarty said the office comes to augment the ongoing works related to Operation Clean Your Frontage. In order for effective monitoring of activities of the campaign in the region, it has become prudent to set up this Operation Clean Your Frontage Secretariat. The Secretariat will be a one-stop shop for all activities under the campaign and would include a regional call center as well as regional office of the city response team. There would be a direct communication to receive sanitation-related complaints and reports are relayed to same in all the 29 districts offices. Mr. Quality also hinted of the official passing out of some 1,000 personnel trained as the region's city response team. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to inform you that the first batch of 1,000 abled men and women who have undergone a one-month intensive military training to instill a high level of discipline and job performance in them will be passing out on 26th of April, 2022. Dear next year, eh? <laughs> and then uh, next week. So media, take note. On the issue of trampling on the right of citizens, Henry Quarte had this to say. My attention has been drawn to 
a statement also made by Amnesty International that we aired in moving people off the streets. I am wondering whether this same Amnesty International goes to places like Dubai and the Western countries, and would they condone and advise people to build containers on the streets? We have a country to govern, and there are laws in the country. The event ended with a tour of the facility. Shadrach Odame Ejari, Metro News. Now talking about laws, the Public Accounts Committee led by James Kujia Feji has called on Parliament to enforce the procurement laws by sanctioning civil and public servants who go against the laws to serve a deterrent to uh, other people. Deterrent to other people who might be thinking of going against the procurement law. So basically, that is what we have found so far, but I uh, have a day meeting uh, sitting on the committee here in, Parliament, uh, in uh, Tamale. Tamale. That is what we have found. Um, we don't know how the rest of the days will go, but as I said, the major thing that we have seen is the disregard to the provisions of the procurement law by the entities. We'll, as a committee, we'll be happy if we don't find anything at all. But now, it is every year this uh, is happening, and it is because that uh, we have not prescribed or we have not applied the law uh, fully. So the thing that they usually come, the camera back. You know, you see some of them begging at the committee. Uh, camera back, then the committee will say, okay, go, don't do it again. Then the following year, it happened again. So if the committee as we, we gave them indication last year that from this year's report, uh, we will not allow or tolerate anything of begging or giving excuses. We have noticed over the years that most of civil and public servants don't take procurement issues serious. So they think that they can go, go against the law, uh, do procurement, do sole sourcing, uh, without obtaining alternative quotations and get free, go free. So what we are going to recommend for Parliament to consider, and if it is adopted, is for the sanctions under <coughs> Section 93, 2, and 1, 1 and 2 of the Public Procurement Act at 9, uh, 6, 3 of 2003, and then the other one, which was amended. Now, Sen Ghana has urged government uh, to set aside a proportion of a COVID-19 trust fund for future pandemics. According to the non-governmental organization, the resource will help in supporting the country's future against pandemics when donors fail to bring in support. Dr. Anyako Kwache was speaking at a dialogue on COVID-19 monitoring report organized by Sen Ghana in Accra. The report was on the theme, COVID-19 awareness and adherence to an effect of government of Ghana's COVID-19 response measures, transparency and accountability around COVID-19 inflows and expenditure. The COVID-19 trust was set up to raise resources in the fight against the virus. Speaking on the findings of the report, Programs Manager Dr. Isaac Anyako Kwachi disclosed that a greater proportion of expenditure on COVID-19 went into procurement of personal protective equipment. He also added that his findings revealed hand washing and the use of sanitizers were strictly complied by the people as the Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies pursued it. He cautioned government to make efforts to set up resources for future pandemics. Yes, we've dealt with COVID-19 up to this point. We may never know what is ahead of us. We put in the right measures, right strategies, so that when we are strike with some other um, pandemic, we wouldn't be found wanting at this level. There's always room for improvement. It said 59.9% of respondents indicated they were aware of the one COVID-19 measures or the other in the fight against the pandemic. About 
of the people were aware of the COVID-19 alleviation program and 97% of them expressed satisfaction with it. Dr. Kwachi noted, despite the gains made in fighting the pandemic, people have started relaxing safety measures due to the easing of the restrictions. He asked government to invest in the infrastructure for e-health and telehealth to enhance vital health service delivery in all health facilities in the country, especially during... Now, away from that, President Akufado has commiserated with the founder of the Lighthouse Group of Churches, Bishop Dakiwood Mills, and his family over the death of his son, David Hewitt Mills. Now, the president on Tuesday visited the family of the deceased and signed in the book of condolence. In it, he wrote, I came to express my sympathies and condolences of my family and I on this tragic loss. I wish the bishop and his family the strength, comfort, and love of the Almighty in this difficult times. Now, may God console and bless the family. You're also watching NewsBT on Metro TV. It's time for us to take a breather, and when we come back, we'll take other segments. Welcome back to Newsbeat on Metro TV. It's time for us to take some business updates. And Kenneth Jesse is standing by. Thank you very much, Annie. Up next is business. Hello again. The Economist Intelligence Unit says Ghana's economy grew by 5% in 2021, signaling a return to normalcy after the COVID-19 pandemic. The unit also predicted a further growth by 5.1% uh, by the end of 2021. The Economist and Intelligence Unit says it expects gold production and processing to strengthen in 2022 driven by the recommissioning of the Bibiani gold mine in Western Ghana, with first gold pour expected in the second half of 2022. The mine's output capacity is expected to be 190,000 ounces in the first 12 months of operation, with a planned ramp up beyond that to 240,000 ounces annually. Output will also be supported by government efforts to curtail illegal mining which will boost formal sector activity. Oil output will rise marginally in 2022. That, the rise in volumes will be only limited despite spikes in oil prices due to the Russia-Ukraine war, reflects Ghana's limited production capacity. The EIU said added in its five-year forecast for Ghana released on April 13, 2022. The EIU stated it expects growth to moderate in 2023-2024 to an average of 4.4% before gradually picking up again to 4.8% on average in 2025-2026. Constrained oil sector growth will keep annual growth below pre-pandemic rates of 6 to 8%. The Deputy Chief Executive Officer in charge of technical operations at the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, Opoku Dankwa, has reportedly been appointed as the corporation's new head. He will be taking over from Kofi Kodwe Sapon, who is due to step down this week as the Chief Executive Officer of GNPC after serving in the role for five years. Dr. Sapon's contract expired earlier this year but he gracefully agreed to stay on for an extended period to oversee the handover to a new CEO. Dr. Sapon's insightful decision to make him deputy chief executive in charge of technical operations in 2020 undoubtedly helped pivot Mr. Dankwa to the top spot due to his diligent execution of GNPC's core operations, the source also said. Dankwa has over 18 years of experience in strategy across multiple businesses with most of his focus in but not limited to oil and gas. He joined GMPC from Valurec, where he managed the North American Strategy, Development and Innovation team. Before this role, Dankwa held senior management positions at Baker Hughes and General Electric. Prior to that, 
He was on the advisory board and also the global strategic marketing manager at Schlumberger's upstream consulting arm. Mr. Dankwa also held a director role at Hart Energy, where he helped establish their consulting and research group. That's it for business. My name is Kenneth Jesse. Phil John Corte is standing by with the latest in sports. Well, thank you very much. It's 47 past midday here in Accra. Up next, we'll bring you sports. So let's focus on African footballer because the 2023 uh, AFCON qualifier groupings has been done on your screen and Nigeria in Group A alongside the men from Freetown, Guinea-Bissau and Satome. For Group B, you have Burkina Faso, Cape Verde, Togo and Swaziland. In Group C, Yaounde, we're talking about Cameroon, Nairobi, Kenya, Namibia and the guys from Burundi. In Group D, Egypt, Guinea, Malawi and Ethiopia. That is where everybody's focus in Group E. You have Ghana, Madagascar, Angola, and the Central African Republic. Once again, in Group A, we have Ghana, Madagascar, Angola, and Central African Republic. We can find Algeria, Uganda, Niger, Tanzania in Group F. Let's go on to the other group in the final. Wow, it's very Malawi, not Malawi, that should be Mali in Group G, alongside Congo, the Gambia, and South Sudan. South Sudan in Group G. Group E, we I think group F rather, is it F rather? It's H. Ivory Coast, we have Zambia, Comoros, Lesotho, and group I, we have Comoros, oh, I think it's Congo rather. Then we have Gabon, Mauritania, and Sudan. Uh, the lies of Senegal, Benin, Mozambique, and Rwanda are in group L. Alongside uh, Morocco, South Africa, we have Zimbabwe and Liberia and K. Then in J, we have Tunisia, Equatorial Guinea, we have the lies of Libya and Botswana. The name once again is Botswana over there in Group G. Well, that's your sports. My name is Phil John Quarty. Desi is standing by for the latest in showbiz. Desi? Thank you very much, Phil. Hopefully, Ghana could qualify for the Afghan 2023. Now, let's do some entertainment news. I am Desmond Okreko Danso. Now, a multiple award winning Ghanaian musician, Famiye, is set to release his second studio album titled Songs of Peter. In a statement released earlier today, the album is expected to be released on Friday, April 29, 2022, and the praise hitmaker is also expected to release the track list for the 12th song project, which features other guest acts in a few days. Famiye, in 2020, released his maiden album, Greater Than, which was a 10 track project and featured the likes of Kiri, Manifest, and Bisokede. The Nothing I Get crooner had earlier posted a video detailing what fans and music lovers should expect from this new album. And that's it for entertainment. My name is Desmond Okreko Dan, so I need standing by for the rest of the bulletin. Thank you, Desmond. Well, that's all we have for you this afternoon on Newsbeat. It came to you live from the Akia Bwahima studio and North Ridge. Follow us on social media as Metro TV, Ghana on Facebook, Metro TV underscore GH on Twitter and Instagram. We're back at 2 with Good Afternoon Ghana for News Flash and at 7 with News Night. My name is Anil Fompovo. Thanks for watching.